Today I'm going to um, show you how I work with 24 karat gold. Um, this is the, the pure gold and um, it used to be that you couldn't get uh, 24 karat because it was so thin and um, they, they mixed other metals to keep it uh, stronger. Um, when it was too thin it broke, uh, or too soft rather, not, not too thin because it was always the one thickness. Um, it was always one, I think, three hundred thousandth of an inch thick, and uh, it's always been the one size. And all of these um, measurements go right back to the time of Tutankhamun in uh, three thousand BC. So how they got it uh, so thin and uh, precise during that time frame is uh, still open to speculation. Um, some people think it must have been the astronauts that came down and helped them because uh, they did micrometer tests on the, uh, the gilding in the tomb of Tutankhamun and found that it was perfectly even across the thickness of the leaf to, uh, to, that, to that very thickness. It was either one two hundred thousandth or one three hundred thousandth of an inch thick. These days they talk in microns, which I don't understand. But uh, it's still generally the same size. And uh, so, of course, they used to mix different metals like copper or uh, brass with the gold to uh, create different carrots and gave it different colours and different strengths. I prefer the look of 24 karat gold. It is pure gold. There's nothing that beats the colour. There's no, uh, no variation in the colour. It's 100% pure. Now, these people that I get it from now um, produce what they call double thickness, so it holds together and it can be pure. Um, so, uh, I've got somewhere what the thickness is. Um, again, it's a bit technical and uh, over my head. I just need uh, to know that I can work with it and it's a colour that's um, uh, true and uh, effective for our clients and uh, desirable and uh, looks right in the end. Uh, what I'm doing today is, again, it's oil gilding, but I've prepared the, the surface of this sample. I'm, I'm producing a sample for a client uh, for some furniture we're doing. And uh, it's all got to be in 24 karat gold. It's quite expensive, so uh, I want them to see exactly what they're going to get. So I've prepared this sample in the same way I would uh, for water gilding. And that's another, uh, another video we'll do on another day. Uh, that's more complicated than this. Uh, and this is more complicated than the, using the Dutch metal or brass leaf. Um, the Schlag metal or imitation gold, that's uh, much thicker. It's much bigger. Uh, the wastage is not a problem. Um, whereas with this real gold, it is a problem. It, it, it gets a bit expensive. But you'll see when I'm uh, getting closer to finishing this that there's really not that much wastage because you use all of the, uh, the sort of offcuts and overlaps uh, with a brushing motion called skewing and that uses up all of the, um, the gold, turns it into dust and it fills in the cracks so uh, there's really not much wastage. But uh, what you do have to consider is on a decorative surface that it's going to take probably at least two sheets for every two square inches. Um, you might map it out and think, well, 12 sheets will do this length of moulding, but it won't because it will split in the hollows. You need then to lay another um, series of leaf over it or another sheet of leaf, and uh, that will fill in the slits, or it may split again in another spot. So you keep doing it till it's all filled and uh, you have to be a little bit more generous with the gold. Um, after all, it's an expensive process anyway. But I prepared this in the same way as I would be doing water gilding, but then I followed on and shellacked it. So I prepared it with a couple of coats of good armor coat, oil-based, to get a good grip, a good key. Then I've used uh, three coats of bowl, which are and they're sanding in between each coat. So in every coat you need to leave probably a day if you can uh, in between coats. Again, there could be a week already getting this up to this stage. Um, and, uh, but you need to, to let things harden properly so that you can prepare it properly. It's all in the prop preparation as to how the finish is going to be. And um, the results will, will speak for themselves. Uh, 
Uh, so after preparing it to water gill, I then sealed it with shellac, um, two coats of shellac, again leaving a day, and then I boiled it. Uh, two days ago, I put a coat of gold sized varnish on it, and that's what the leaf's going to stick to. So this is um, oil gilding uh, with 24 karat gold, and um, what I did. When you burnish in bowl, you can burn it. When you do water gilding, you can burnish it after you've gilded it because you're compacting the gold and the clay base underneath. The bowl is a clay base. But what I've done here is prepared it and used the agate to compress the bowl before I shall act it. So that's given me brighter highlights. So there's going to be some variation when you see the gilding finished that it'll be slightly duller in the hollows and um, uh, more highly polished on the highlights. So I've polished it before the gilding as opposed to water gilding it where you polish it after the gilding. And that's an agate stone which uh, you, you, you can pack the clay with and you polish the highlights with. Um, agate is a semi-precious stone and they come in different shapes so you can get into uh, different kinds of areas that you might want to get into. Uh, so uh, it's probably time to uh, lay a bit of leaf and uh, some people say, well, it looks pretty easy, but uh, that's <laughs> you can't afford to breathe or uh, the leaf might just um, might uh, fly away. So each one of these sheets is at least a dollar, so you don't want to, to be working in a, in a, um, a, a drafty or breezy, breezy room. And I find most cases when I'm... Uh, when I'm doing this, I often have to hold my breath because um, you can be going to uh, lay a leaf and inadvertently sort of breathe on it and it'll just blow away. And um, so sometimes I have to just stop and take a breath and uh, then hold my breath when I'm laying it. Um, probably tend to get a bit lightheaded after a while. Um, you do have to have a break every now and then. But at least with oil gilding, you can just keep going until it's... Um, till it's all laid and finished and filled. With water gilding, you can only just do a small section at a time where you, you moisten the clay base with a, with a wet brush, softens the clay and the leaf sticks to the clay. And then when that um, dries or hardens, then uh, you can come back and clean it and burnish the highlights. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and do uh, a little bit now. Um, as I say, a lot of people think this uh, looks sort of easy, but um, I read a book once which used the term that uh, working with gold leaf is incommunicable in words. You really, you can't really describe the, uh, well, as that book said, the manual dexterity required. It often will just go where it wants to go, not where I want it to go. Um, and uh, I'm using a little uh, beaver head brush Pure, oh, this one's pure squirrel from Germany, and uh, that just picks up a little bit of static. Some people rub it in their hair, which uh, I think is a bit of nonsense, but um, probably looks okay. So I'm just getting a leading edge to uh, attach to the oiled surface there, and I'm tapping it into the hollows. Um, it's uh, it's worth mentioning that when you grab a book. Uh, this, this is loose leaf gold uh, for, for uh, decorative surfaces. You might see sign writers and uh, people who use gold leaf on a flat surface. They use what's known as transfer gold. And that's uh, the gold sort of slightly attached to the paper. So you can lay the paper on uh, to the surface and then peel the paper off. And theoretically, the, the leaf will stick to the surface. Um, it's worthwhile when you get a book to just loosen it up a little so it doesn't, uh, it isn't sort of stuck to the paper by its own, um, sort of static, I guess. Uh, there's 25 sheets in each book. It's always been that way. It used to be uh, leaf produced in Australia, but most of it comes from Germany and now from China. And you can get, as I say, you can get different carrots, different colours. You can get white gold. Um, I've heard you can get copper, although I've never used it. So I'm using this 
little brush to kind of tap it into the hollows and uh, I don't know whether you'll see from that uh, distance but it, it, it is all split in the hollows. It sticks to the highest part naturally. Um, again, I'm overlapping it uh, like kind of roof tiles but with the real gold it's so fine that um, you won't see any joints uh, because it's uh, nice and shiny. Uh, this gold will it's so thin, it will pretty much stick to a shine, uh, if that makes sense. It, you don't need too much in the way of uh, an adhesive, is what I mean. That um, If you laid this leaf, it would virtually stick to a piece of glass, to the shininess of the glass, because uh, it's just that fine. The big trick so here, sometimes it's more difficult to uh, separate the pages without uh, damaging the gold underneath, so you've got to be kind of, well, you've got to be very gentle. I'm just dragging an edge off the paper, I'm holding it at the back. Some parts of this sample are going to be painted, so. Uh, if it looks like I've missed something, it, it, it may be just that I don't need to gild that section. But for the sake of this exercise, I will uh, obviously try and get it right. Make it look right anyway, even if I, it doesn't all need to be gilded. Um, and quite often when you gild something like this, you put a toner over it, which um, fills in the hollows as well. So you have a darker colour in the hollows and leave the highlight totally bright. And uh, that creates a contrast which accentuates the shape. Um, if you just leave it all bright without some sort of contrast, you tend to lose the detail. It's just too shiny and uh, can look a bit too new looking as well. With the real gold, particularly with 24 karat, you don't necessarily need to seal it, you don't need to put anything over it. Um, again, referring back to the classic. Tomb of Tutankhamun. After 3,000 years, from 3,000 BC, uh, it's still perfect. Uh, but after all, consider that's like a that was all sealed up and uh, it was not subject to being handled or touched or uh, smoke or dust. Uh, that was in a vacuum. Uh, so. If something's going to be handled, you can seal it, and uh, it um, will protect it. You'll lose some of its natural glow, and uh, it, it just depends on what you're working on. These days, uh, when we're working on something that's going to be handled, I, I cover it with a coat of um, clear marine varnish. That's about the strongest thing you can find around. and. Um, uh, but you, you tend to just lose a bit. The, the, the marine varnish, which is the highest glossiest uh, material I've been able to find that's um, suitable, it, it's not as shiny as the real gold will be on its own. So what I've done here, and this is the more economical way to work with gold, is to, um, I've cut a sheet up into six pieces here. And uh, so now I'm going to just fill in some of the gaps, some of the smaller areas that I didn't lay the big, big leaf onto and um, just fill them in uh, before I start doing the main filling. So this is a kid skin um, board and these are sort of purpose knives. One I use for cutting and one I use for, for sort of lifting the leaf. And uh, you can cut it into quite small pieces. Sometimes you'll lose more than you gain. Um, because it might break up, uh, the wind might blow, someone might open a door about 50 feet away and eventually the wind will come through and just blow the leaf and you don't even know where it came from. Um, so that's a bit uh, dementing. I prefer to work with gold when I'm on my own, like today, uh, where I know that um, no one's going to come in or you know, walk past uh, creating a draft which might hit my table, you know, could be 
five minutes late and you just don't know where that draft came from. Um, but it's, it's pretty annoying when you see your leaf blowing across the room. Um, as I say, I think this is sort of going uh, okay. You can uh, tap it down to make sure it's got contact with um, the, the areas you want and then you can kind of see the other bits you need to fill. Um, then when we start filling, I'll use one of these mop brushes, uh, which um, gilders and French polishers use these as well. They're, they're quite expensive, but uh, extremely soft. And uh, you can't use anything stronger than that with this gold. It's so thin, you'll just lose for a while. So I'm going to cut up a few more pieces and uh, just fill in some of the major gaps and then uh, I'll show you uh, how, how I'm sort of going to skew the gold and fill it. I'm not going to bother around the back. That's all going to be painted. Um, it's going to be a cream colour. Uh, and this is a sample for uh, a whole series of carved furniture we're about to do for a, a cabinet maker and uh, his client. Um, so that furniture should be arriving in a week or so. And... Um, I'm looking forward to that. That's quite a big job, and uh, it's going to be beautiful because it's all 24 karat gold, and uh, there's something really beautiful about seeing uh, good quality furniture finished to the highest standard, um, both in uh, carving and the finishing. Um, when I say finishing, I mean the gilding, and. Um, Really looking forward to that job. So just kind of helps paste to have some fingernails. Um, I think some people have used like tweezers to pick this up. Uh, as I say, it's so thin you can see through it when you hold it up to the window. Um, I can take a sheet and just scrubble it up into actually nothing. It, it goes so fine that you won't even detect where the leaf was because it's so thin. I'm trying not to breathe on it. I don't want to lose it. So I might just do a bit more filling. I'll do one more sheet, uh, which I'll cut up and fill into areas. And then I'll show you how we skew the gold. And then there's another little trick you can do as well. After the gilding, um, if there's still any little gaps showing, I've read in books where you can, um, well, not so much gaps, but splits in the hollows. And as I say, the hollows don't count a lot because they're usually toned with something. They usually have a dark colour in them. They usually go darker because they're not highlighted. Um, read where after gilding that um, different people use like a gold powder to just fill in the gaps or, or the hollows or the splits and uh, these days we've got something called mica powder which is a, a natural product uh, when I say natural it's, it's made up of ground um, uh, ground tortoise shell, I think it is. No, not tortoise shell, mother of pearl shell. So it's got this natural luster and it's, uh, because it's not metallic, it never uh, tarnishes. And it's a natural product which um, fluoresces or illuminates with light. So um, I've been, uh, it's something I'm not sure whether other people do it, but on uh, some jobs I've done, when I finished it, I just, uh, sprinkle a bit of that uh, mica powder over it as well. And um, we sort of used that when we were doing the Crown Casino uh, project as a base colour for some screens because we wanted uh, very decorative screens, very difficult to, to gild. And around the edges, we, we actually prepared a, a lacquer first, and uh, which had uh, mica powder in it. And we did that as a base colour so that any edges that didn't uh, take the leaf 
uh, still looked cold, and uh, that was a bit of a rush job anyway. It was uh, kind of dumped on us when someone else couldn't do it. And uh, it was a big job that made for months. Some months. But that cheers go now. So what I'm going to do now is just, uh, with this uh, hot brush, is to effectively just fill in the gaps. And it might look like I'm wasting leaf, but I haven't sort of overlapped much at this point. And all of this gets used because by doing that, that's called skewing the gold, and it's lifting off all the overlaps and all the spare stuff and it's pushing it into the hollows. You don't want to press too hard, but um, it's also a case of, uh, I will be leaving this again for a, a good day, or probably, I mean, today is Saturday, so I'll leave it till Monday. Uh, I'll come back and sort of clean off the, the residue. Might, uh, waste too much leaf here. Here's some quarter pieces here. Not sure how much you can see in detail here at this angle, but um, it's all starting to fill in. It's all starting to look quite nice. This job I might be doing shortly for a Greek church, and this is the uh, technique I'll be using. Some areas it's uh, it's not uh, practical to do water gilding. You do it in your workshop or studio or a nice covered area, but um, as I say, drafts are an enemy, and uh, you've really got to be in a, a nice working environment to. Uh, to, to get a good job, it's got to be dust free and uh, preferably no one thrashing around or even walking. So I'm going to use, these are only some half books I had, I'm just checking, I think there's a few little pieces in this one. Um, I haven't really used two books, these were just uh, some leftovers. know that I've still got to uh, do another video shortly of uh, how we finish off that uh, large decorative frame or any of uh, the finishing of them. Um, and when I say finishing, that'll be the cleaning, the sealing, the shellac, and then the toning. Um, you can see the difference. I think you can see behind me there's a couple of frames there that have been gilded but not cleaned or shellac. And then there's a finished one. Uh, the larger one has been um, cleaned, shellac, and toned. And that's sort of how it'll end up looking, rather than bright and shiny. Um, as I say, with uh, most gilding, you're better off to uh, finish it with some sort of contrast so that it, you, you accentuate the highlight. It actually makes your, your gilding look better if the hollows or the surrounding areas are duller and uh, it brings out the detail shows off the shape and uh, creates a more lustrous looking finish. So that's all I'm doing on this for today until I uh, come back and uh, paint this inner edge. I'm probably going to paint this flat surface around here and around the back and that'll create some uh, really interesting contrast. And you can see that uh, highlights are looking pretty shiny and smooth. Any little furry overlaps, I'm going to leave till it's hard. I don't want to tear them off. Not that I think they will turn it, tear off, but um, uh, it, it's better to leave it. It's all covered now. It's all intact. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to leave it for today, and uh, hope that's uh, been helpful. And um, this is just another lesson I'm giving in the hope that you'll um, use gilt wood uh, for uh, your next gilding project whether it be uh, architectural or furniture. Um, you know, we use all techniques, all styles. Been doing it for 40 years, and uh, that's what I love to do. So uh, 
I hope you enjoyed the uh, the video, and uh, I look forward to meeting meeting you in my store one day. Thanks again.